right, I'll let everybody in now. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for your patience in the waiting room. We're just waiting for the last couple of people to enter before we get started. Lovely. Well, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I am currently broadcasting to you from, the Yagara and Turrbal people. I pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So I'm really pleased to be here with you all tonight for this very special discussion of Bill Botel's new book, Unmasked, The Politics of Pandemics. Um, before I hand you over to our speakers tonight, I just want to really quickly reiterate some of the information that you were sent um, in the email with your link to join us this evening. So you have all automatically been placed on mute and you'll remain so throughout the evening, but that doesn't mean that Bill isn't keen to answer your questions. He has assured me that he is. Um, you can ask them using the chat box function that we have on Zoom. If you can't see it, it should be towards the lower left of your screen. And if you still can't find it, then don't worry too much because it's where I'm going to be pasting the link that you can use to purchase your copies of Unmasked this evening. So when I do, the chat box will pop up on your screens and you can type your questions in there as well as following that link to grab your copies of the book if you haven't already. Um, lastly, we rarely have any technical issues, but if we do, um, we ask that you um, are patient and um, allow us to quickly rectify them. So if one of our speakers drops out tonight, we'll take a short break and um, resume the conversation as soon as we readmit them. Um, if one of you happens to drop out and have any connection issues, then just use the link that you were sent in the email, the same link to rejoin, and I'll make sure that I readmit you as soon as possible so that you don't miss out. Um, so it's now my pleasure to introduce Bill Botel. Bill is one of Australia's foremost health policy strategists. As senior advisor to the Australian Health Minister, he has an architect of Australia's world-renowned response to the emergence of HIV AIDS, which brought together affected communities, researchers, clinicians, and politicians, changing the course of the Australian pandemic and saving thousands of lives. For over four decades, Bill has served in many roles and capacities at the intersection of health, development, and politics in Australia and internationally. He served as a senior advisor to Australian Prime Minister Paul Keating, from 2005, Bill led the advocacy organization Pacific Friends of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria, and worked with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to increase funding and support for the Global Fund. Since early 2020, Bill has written, broadcast and tweeted extensively on the Australian and international response to the coronavirus pandemic. And in conversation with Bill tonight, we have Steve Austin. Steve is a presenter of ABC Radio National's Drive and has previously worked on ABC TV's 730 and Stateline in Queensland. He has also worked in regional ABC Radio and Capital City Radio, having started at 4ZZZ a long time ago, which he says he misses. And so, Steve and Bill, it's now my pleasure to hand over to you both for tonight's discussion. Emma Kate, thanks very much. Bill Botel, it's an honor to be uh, to be questioning you. Bill, I want to ask you up front something you can conclude towards the end of your book, Unmasked, The Politics of Pandemics. You say that pandemics create new politics. Where would we see that today in Australia? Well, uh, in the last 12 months, when we had the first horrible onslaught of COVID, you'll recall that the Australian government took sweeping measures uh, in respect of many sectors that have fundamentally altered those sectors and they are still recovering from them. I'm thinking here particularly about the arts sector, but the university sector. All of these sectors uh, were high employment areas and many people and businesses were plunged onto the scrap heap uh, on the unemployment lists. Uh, businesses did not survive or were severely impacted because they couldn't have access to JobKeeper and the people couldn't have the income support and so on. 
but you'll see that right through the economy. We saw what happened in relation to superannuation. Uh, the uh, draining of young people's superannuation accounts to their great disbenefit uh, in years to come. So a lot was done uh, with the excuse, with the rationale that this was required to meet the anticipated direction of the COVID pandemic. Now, as it turned out, uh, the COVID pandemic didn't uh, go that badly in Australia. It went badly, of course, for the almost 1,000 people who regrettably died and, and the people who were struck ill. But compared to other countries, the US, the UK, it didn't have that devastating cataclysmic impact. Uh, the Australian people understood what had to be done, the premiers, and we, by behavioural measures, restricted the health impacts and therefore the economic impacts, but it didn't stop these massive structural changes being implemented uh, by the federal government. And we are still seeing the working through of those changes now. And things have changed dramatically, particularly if you're in those sectors that were effectively deconstructed by the decisions made uh, over the last 12 months. I'll come back to some of those towards the end of our discussion ahead of the uh, questions from the, the viewers who are listening. But one of the few areas you credit the federal government with was the reasonably early closing of the international borders, uh, which in many ways was one of the reasons why we were successful in shutting the virus out to a limited extent. Were, the, were there any areas other than that that you think the federal government did well in their initial response to the pandemic? No, no, I don't. Uh, and in fact, the closing of the border uh, was only with, or, or was with China, where of course the problem erupted, but it was pretty clear at the time in February, uh, February, March, that uh, the travel that needed to be restricted was coming from Europe and the United States. And in the end, the corona, the corona infections that came into Australia came uh, from Europe and the United States and elsewhere. So uh, yes, it was right to uh, shut direct travel uh, from China. Indirect travel still took place. But as I saw at the end of February, when I was back in Sydney, I came back in early February last year from London uh, through a Sydney airport that was devoid of almost anybody, including mm -hmm. customs people, but certainly no temperature checking or border security or control or any indication at all that uh, Sydney Airport was being protected, put under surveillance as this pandemic was beginning to rage around the world. So it was very deficient. Uh, the protection of the borders was poor, frankly. Uh, we saw what happened with the Ruby Princess uh, later on in, in March when the great confusion took place, which resulted in hundreds of cases being distributed around Australia. Uh, the planning was poor. They were planning for an influenza type uh, situation when in fact it was not influenza. It was far more lethal and deadly than that. It was a new virus. And uh, really the strategy that was developed was one of wait and see, let it in, let it run. This was what was being done in the United Kingdom. Don't shut the borders, don't restrict internal travel. Now, they, in our area, the person who understood the stakes really well was Prime Minister Ardern in New Zealand. And uh, when she was confronted with the same facts and spread of the virus around the world in Asia and so on, uh, with her advisors, uh, New Zealand took the great decision to stop the thing at the border. And as February went into March last year, uh, I think that leadership, that example, that debate was uh, had all over Australia. It was certainly had by the premiers and the state ministers, uh, and certainly, absolutely, the core of it was the debate in the public health system. The great glory of Australia is the public health system. The doctors, the nurses, the administrators, the clinicians, uh, the, uh, when I say the ordinary people, I mean the mass of the people in the public health system knew something was up. And they put the pressure on the state premiers and on March the 22nd, uh, they effectively overthrew the wait and see, let it in approach of the federal government and did the great thing of locking down Australia. And that one decision led over 20 
2020 uh, to effectively elimination of COVID in Australia with lots of ups and downs as we saw in Melbourne and eruptions, but, but the strategy was to eliminate, to get down to zero, zero. And that was the view that the people took and the premiers took and many, many lives and much disruption and heartache was saved because of that decision. Can you speak to this at all? The question about uh, letting it run, some Nordic countries went to let it run past, Sweden notably. Yeah. Uh, was that a scientific dispute or split or was it a political one? What was it? that? Because there were some Nordic countries that did let that and now they've regretted that decision. Yes. Uh, well, what really drove the let it in, let it run at the top level was in the United States under the regime of the discredited former president, uh, we remember, and uh, in the United Kingdom. And they came under a great deal of pressure from some in the business community, not everybody, and people involved in the travel sector especially, that said you should not restrict movement across borders or within countries or within the European Federation. So it was a libertarian argument. States. It was a libertarian argument of sorts, libertarian, not well, medical it was science. Libertarian, argument. but it was, it was done in the service of an economic uh, uh, interest. Okay. And you'll recall last year that we had this really silly debate saying, well, we can't have the public health uh, shutdown you want because it will affect the economy. That was the argument. It was like either it was or public health or the economy. A year later, of course, it's completely clear, as it was to anybody really who thought about it a year ago, that the argument was public health and the economy. Get it down to zero, zero. Your economy will not shrink as much, uh, or if at all, and the recovery will be that much better. And it stands to reason if consumers, voters, taxpayers, people are not sick or dying or scared of their jobs, they're out doing things and buying things and, uh, and, and doing all the things that help with economic activity and recovery. And they're doing it without the threat of COVID uh, in their community and their family. So this was a, a really terrible digression uh, that came out of the United States in the United Kingdom to a degree in Europe. And then in places like Sweden, I don't, uh, I'm not pretend to know Sweden intimately, but mm. You had an ideological, uh, sort of an academic argument that, well, you could contain this to old people who somehow seem to be expendable. And uh, if, if the old people uh, died, uh, then it would be better for everybody else and uh, young people could never get it. Well, on the science, they were wrong. And of course, Sweden, in many ways, has recorded worse outcomes than the neighbouring Nordic states. Yes. And, and that's putting aside what I, I, I personally think it's just the moral question that nobody is expendable or throwable on the scrap heap. Every life is worth saving and uh, every person is worth protecting from uh, a deadly new disease. I'd like to come to the issue of the vaccine rollout here in Australia as it is today in just a moment. But yeah. before I do that, I want to draw on your experience of the 1980s and Australia's response to the HIV crisis. Yeah. You were intimately involved in that. And you learned a great many important lessons there. One of the ones that's the lines that stood out to me in your uh, book, Unmask the Politics of Pandemics, was you've got to tell the truth. Now, what, what for you were the key lessons from the HIV crisis of the 80s so that we can look at that for, for this crisis today? Well, well, you're quite right. And uh, I look back on the horrible times of HIV. Uh, we had the problem in Australia before we knew we had it, as we did in the world. And believe it or not, it took months and months, if not years, for science to even figure out what it was, that it was a virus. Uh, it, it's prehistoric compared to what happens today. But uh, in those days, uh, when Bob Hawke was the Prime Minister and Neil Blewett, great Neil Blewett was the Minister for Health for whom I worked. Uh, Neil, Bob, uh, together with Andrew Peacock, who's the leader of the opposition and the senior members of the opposition all took a decision that they would keep party politics out of it, that they would listen to the science and the evidence and the experts, and all of that would be in the public domain. So we, there was a lot we didn't know about how HIV spread and how it caused AIDS, but it soon became apparent that if you did simple behavioral things like using condoms or 
giving clean needles to injecting drug users or making sure that uh, sex workers only use condoms and, and so on, and there was proper sterilization of equipment. If you did all of these things, you could really stop the spread of the virus or, or the trans easy transmission. But to do that, you had to draw on all the expertise of so many people, scientists, doctors, clinicians, most importantly, the people who live with it, bring them into one room, uh, bring all the science and evidence in, and it was all in the public domain. Nothing was secret. Nothing was held back by the federal government or the ministers. It was debated, and the more it was debated and contested and argued, uh, the stronger the policy recommendations were. And some of them were extremely radical. Uh, they'd be radical today, but they're pretty radical in the 80s. <laughs> Talk, frankly, about sex and gay sex and injecting drug use and sex work and goodness me, you know, all the things we had to do and uh, Ida Buttrose and Carla Zampatti, uh, uh, many of those people came on board in those years to talk to the Australian people openly and honestly about what was happening and why we had to do these things. Now, trust is the key. If you are transparent and tell the truth, you build trust. And the Australian people had to trust that when we were saying that you had to use condoms for gay men. You had to talk about illicit activities, uh, drug use and injecting drug use. You had to bring this out into the open and talk about it frankly and honestly. And very radical things had to be accepted and funded by the Australian people. You couldn't do that without trust. Uh, and while there were some mistakes or missteps, broadly, we cemented a great coalition of people who all signed off on the same thing and understood it in the same way. Come forward to today, uh, all of this has been handled within the national security structures of the, of the government. Things are secret. The projections are secret. The papers are secret. The discussions, the advice that comes from a very small, relatively select group of people who, in my view, wrongly advised the government a year ago to let it in and let it run, uh, was all done and then sprung on the Australian people. And then in February, March last year, that resulted in a great internal unnecessary brawl, a debate, which happily came out in favour of stopping it at the border and eliminating the virus. But it was a pretty close run thing. And as we've seen in recent days, I mean, this has gone on all year, uh, projections about vaccine rollout and what's going on and the numbers and everything like that. All of these things have just become uh, sprung on the people with inadequate explanation. And therefore, people, if they, if they know they're not being told the truth, really, or it's not transparent, they begin to doubt and they lose trust. And it's such an unnecessary thing to happen, uh, particularly when we've still got very many terrible months ahead of us to cope with the next phase of this of this pandemic. So one thing I can say, uh, trust is in, it is in terrible, uh, terribly important. No one person, no one government, no one minister, no one advisor knows everything, but everything that people do know at the top, at, at, who are skilled and expert, has to be on the table and contested and debated. That's the democratic way, but it's also the best way for securing public health. Uh, can, you, can you clarify your answer for me just in one area the secrecy involved here? Was that at the request of the national cabinet, which involves all of the state premiers and the federal government or just the, the federal government's uh, national security committee, please? No, it was it was done right at the beginning under the terms of the Human Biosecurity Act. Okay. Uh, and it was taken into the national security structures of cabinet. Uh, what was the justification for that? Well, you, well, might you ask? I, you see, many things were known. The, uh, the progress of the virus in China was known to many of the people you'd expect to know these things. But that information wasn't shared. And it certainly wasn't shared in Australia to the public health systems and structures. It came from the top down and the information has doled out. Well, you can't do it that way when you have a virus that is spreading at the speed of a jet plane around the world mm. 
and is very contagious and very dangerous. It changed every day, every hour. So uh, holding back information, deciding whether you used it for a political purpose, as we saw with the previous regime in the United States, who were, who were, on, who were doing this all the time, uh, trying to influence uh, their political uh, in, uh, outcomes or what they had on the news or all of this stuff is completely irrelevant. Now, there was a public health emergency, a new virus, and we needed all hands to analyze and assess the evidence. And then very particularly to uh, talk to the people and understand what they would do. One of the great failings of uh, the small group who were running things last year was to make heroic assumptions that the Australian people would not ever accept a lockdown, that they would never do such a thing, that this was in, impossible and inconceivable and why would you do it? Well, I know from my time in HIV uh, and uh, uh, with Dr. Blewett and with the people who are the political leaders then, the one thing I learned was to so trust and put my faith in the goodness and common sense of the Australian people if you level with them and told them the truth. And I think, uh, as we saw with the premiers, uh, Premier Palaszczuk and uh, Premier McGowan and Premier Berejiklian and so on, uh, they trusted the people and the people did what was right. We went into lockdown. It was terribly uh, disturbing to people and with all the consequences we know, but they knew it was for the best, that it would save lots of lives and while it was inconvenient and expensive and all the things that it was, uh, it was best for all of us. And we saw in countries where that didn't happen, where there was no trust, where in the United States and the United Kingdom, where the fact of the lockdown, the fact of wearing masks, the, the fact of these simple things that save lives in itself became a political brawl. But with, with libertarian people and... Uh, you know, uh, yes. enthusiasts and zealots of all sorts. And you think, oh, really? I mean, <laughs> how, could such a, how, how could such a thing happen? And to a great degree, uh, thanks to the Australian people, while that sort of thing did happen to a degree in Australia, it was ever only at the fringes. And um, even those people in the end uh, wore masks and did the right thing, I suspect. It's worth noting that the trust the premiers you observe put in the people that trust was reciprocated in Queensland here at a state election and in Western Australia at a state election overwhelmingly yeah. the people responded in kind in a sense didn't they well uh, my old boss uh, Paul Keating uh, often made the point that uh, good policy is good politics uh, uh, so if you do the right thing and the people understand it and they forgive you the ups and downs of it. I mean, we, we, sure. we did see a terrible problem emerge in Victoria because some of the settings were wrong and they didn't have what they had in Queensland and New South Wales, a very strong, robust public health system, good at contact tracing and good in the regions and so on that had atrophied in Victoria and that, that was a mistake. But the Premier down there uh, took it on the chin and I think he fronted a press conference every day for 100 days for the 15 long weeks that the Victorians had to endure to get it down to zero. And the people are very forgiving, but uh, uh, I think, but uh, you know, that was the right thing to do. And if you do the right thing, well, it can hardly be surprising uh, that in what is the most disruptive event that I've ever lived through, the people give a tick to the people who did the right thing. Uh, More disruptive than the HIV crisis of the eighties? The HIV crisis in Australia could have become very serious, uh, but it didn't because it was a bit like a smaller version. You know, it could have become very serious in Australia, but because we mobilised the people closest to the problem and got ahead of it, uh, the gay community, injecting drug users, sex workers and people most at risk, and we put in these radical and bold measures, we confined it effectively <clears throat> to the first groups who were infected. Right. That wasn't the case in the United States. It went into the heterosexual population. And of course, in the world, I mean, 35 million people have died in 40 years as a result of HIV. And 
many tens of millions more than that have been infected and still suffering. So if you like, we learned what to do in Australia with HIV, uh, speak openly and honestly, very importantly believe you can prevent it. There's a lot of approach taken by, um, I don't know, by apocalyptic movies and Hollywood that somehow postulates a virus as being an unstoppable killer, but it's not. It's just an infection engine. It's subject to the laws of physics, chemistry, biology, and mathematics. And even though they can be very deadly, uh, I'm thinking of things like Ebola and uh, Zika, but HIV and this, uh, the great understanding that came in Australia was that by simple behavioral measures, you can, uh, if people will change behavior, you can stop its spread. And that proved to be the case, even with something that's more infectious than HIV, which was coronavirus and COVID infection. Mm. So it's there. You don't have to collapse in a heap and throw your hands up and think the end of the world is coming. In fact, quite the reverse. And in HIV, we learned that if we restricted it, changed behaviour, waited for better days, and it was 13 years before we had treatments, and we still don't have a vaccine, but we have you know, we're on top of the thing now and we kept it there. It could have been tens of thousands of people more infected and dying and dead in Australia had we not done it. Okay. Uh, and that was what I drove me a lot in the last year when I saw that, truthfully, uh, a lot of people from those days, 40 years ago now, uh, they've gone, they've retired, some died, you know, the, all of that history has been lost. and. Uh, you could see how this generation were repeating many of the same mistakes that were made in the world uh, about how not to handle a viral outbreak. And I think it's important we, regrettably, but we did learn, have to relearn those lessons. Well, let's look at those lessons right now with the rollout of the vaccine in Australia today. From where you sit, what have we not learned? What have we not adapted that's meant that while we stop the virus early, despite apparent commitments, uh, we have not reached anywhere near the required vaccination of Australia, even with a two-stage vaccination process? What's the problem, Bill Botel? Well, uh, again, it's uh, a question of the actual administration and management of the bureaucracy of the federal government. Uh, the Australian people put in the hard yards to secure zero, zero for a year, right? This is a great thing. But in the rest of the world, we have the virus still raging and we have even more troublesome and dangerous variants emerging all over the world. With the most remarkable application, it has to be said, the pharmaceutical companies and science delivered a range of workable vaccines about the end of last year. Well, An incredible speed. <laughs> un unbelievably good. And we have to pay tribute to those scientists and everybody who did that. And you might guess I'm not a fan of the previous regime in the United States, but uh, it has to be said that uh, the Trump administration, if they did one thing, it was when they had to, they backed American industry and the pharmaceutical industry, put the money on the, ta on the table, didn't matter what it cost, and was a big part in getting these vaccines to market, as was in Europe and uh, the United Kingdom. So that was all coming down the track. So our, our challenge a year uh, at the end of last year was really to do what everybody else was doing and back every horse in the race, not just this vaccine or that vaccine, put money behind everything. Because whatever it costs to get the options for the vaccines and to fund it is a drop in the ocean compared to the costs you run if you don't do it. So I thought, it was a, we all thought, a very good idea, get as much vaccine as you can on order. That's what they did in the United States uh, with Pfizer, which they did in, in England, in the UK. Uh, Boris Johnson, after a catastrophic year, disaster, 100,000 people dead and horrible things in the UK, they did back every horse. So by the end, beginning of January, there was a supply ready to go and put into people's arms. Now, that wasn't done here. In fact, it was... You're not talking about doses. You're talking about different potential 
brands vaccine, of virus, if you like. So we have a vaccine, I'm sorry. Vaccine candidates. So you had AstraZeneca, you had Pfizer, uh, Moderna, Novavax, J&J. We, we saw that there were vaccines developed in Russia and China. Uh, so there were many, many vaccine candidates. They're all horses in ready to race. <laughs> uh, we saw, unfortunately, what happened at the University of Queensland. That seemed promising and then fell over. But that's the nature of science. And really what you've got to do is back every, everything so that you hope that some will come home and you've got options to supply. Now, that's almost all of the OECD, the European countries, many, many countries did that and Australia didn't. It did not. It, it actually rejected putting options for some of these vaccines and we put all of our attention into uh, AstraZeneca and to a degree Pfizer. Now, that was a mistake because there are, I think, I'm not a, an expert in these things, but it is clear that however you make AstraZeneca, there are problems in manufacture. Uh, it seems to be more difficult to manufacture this vaccine. So as good as it is, AstraZeneca has had production problems all over the world. Uh, what they thought they were going to deliver, they didn't. Well, that's also what happens that's you know, one of those things uh, but the risks we ran were obvious and uh, the AstraZeneca supply has been terribly constricted we didn't have enough Pfizer and we had no other plan in case things didn't work out as people hoped and here we are uh, we are somewhere about a hundredth in the world between Bolivia and Albania, <laughs> the number of people who got vaccines. Today, 95% of uh, Australians are not vaccinated. We have variants in the world. We've seen the B117 variant in Queensland, which caused the problem the other day. Uh, and we have a problem in Papua New Guinea. And we have a situation in the United States, even though they are inoculating 4 million people a day, that's the entire population of Australia in a week. and they are on track to have all of the adult population have access to vaccines in the next week or two. The new cases are going up by, to, by in some areas by 19% to about 65,000 a day because the variant that came out of the UK, the UK variant is now becoming the dominant variant in the United States. So we're not out of this. The vaccines are not cures. And the best thing we can do is to inoculate the entire Australian population with the best possible vaccine in the shortest possible time. And, not, and, and therefore we are strong, strong as we can be against variants, against the possibility that we could you know, go through this thing again. We don't want that to happen. So uh, it has, the supply question has been very poor. The distribution arrangements seem to have been gelled with governments in the last week or two when they should have been planned for six months. Uh, GPs are important, of course, but the whole population of Australia cannot go through the GPs offices in three months, even if they've got the supply. The pharmacies are important, of course, but you have to have the mass centres because you've got to vaccinate 100, 200,000 people a day if you're going to do this anytime soon. But today, there is no agreed target, no statement as to when the entire Australian population will be inoculated with both jabs of AstraZeneca or, or whatever. None. The, the only target now is, well, October the 31st, by the end of October, uh, all adult Australians will have had access to one jab. Well, that's far too slow. The mm. virus doesn't care. The virus is not working on the time it takes for approvals and uh, people to have uh, Zoom conferences and chit chats in Australia. We have to, we have to run and, work and go at the speed of the virus. We, the virus is mutating faster than we are inoculating. And this is a very potentially serious problem. We've got to get it around the other way. And if, if the federal government cannot secure the supply it needs, Personally, uh, I know the United States 
is moving into a situation of, of supply, of excess supply of Pfizer. Well, I think a lot of work has to be done to discuss with the United States about uh, securing additional Pfizer vaccines or uh, Novavax or any of these other so-called mRNA vaccines, which are evidently pretty good, I'm advised, and we've got to get that supply in as fast as we possibly can. And if we've got to overthrow the slow and steady approval processes that have delayed the AstraZeneca approval, well, good. So be it. I think that's what the Australian people would say. We want a safe vaccine, but if you wouldn't mind just uh, expediting everything you can and cutting all the unnecessary uh, red tape and doing it as fast as possible, uh, we'd be very appreciative. We're about 10 or 15 minutes away from uh, listeners' questions. So let me ask you about the, uh, the, the next phase. In, in your book, Unmask the Politics of Pandemics, you highlight again and again the, the failings of the Australian, well, the Australian Federation in dealing with this. You're critical of the Commonwealth say that the states have got the health infrastructure, they've kept funding it to a re pretty reasonable level. Is, this, uh, is the states of Australia a solution to this next phase problem for you, Bill Botel? Look, uh, they are a far bigger part of it than I would have thought possible a year and a, a, year and a month ago, truthfully. Under the, in the HIV days, what we did federally was we put a big public health capacity in the federal government, in the Department of Health. Now, that has eroded over time. And I just want to be very clear that after the change of government in 2013, that public health capacity that used to be in the Department of Health federally was dismantled. It was deconstructed. Uh, people who actually did things. And it wasn't, of course, in the, in the states and territories. And it happened slowly. It sort of happened by agreement. Nobody quite said no, but it was deconstructed by the bean counters and by the people who said that the federal government should have no, didn't have to have a really robust public health capacity at the top level. Well, we've seen where that leads us. Uh, the, the federal government did not have on tap a, uh, an in-house experienced full of memory public health structure when this thing came out of the blue in the end of 2019. So it fell to the states and their existing public health structures to do as best they could. But it's not really the right way to run things in the future. So we must have the most searching open, honest, transparent accounting of what has gone on in the last year, what's going on now. Uh, all of the documents, all of the facts, all of the figures, all of the advice has to be out there. And then we have to put together a better structure at the national level, uh, whether that's in health or, you know, we're separate to it. So you mean some sort of post-pandemic sort of national commission of inquiry where all oh. those secret documents you mentioned before are actually before a judge so they can be assessed or a retired, some sort of commissioner? Of course. And it's not to, it's not to be fatuous about uh, attributing a blame, but you have to be accountable because a lot of things were being done and spoken about and planned for that if they had been implemented a year ago, would have ended us up in a very much worse situation than we ended up in. And that was the first year of it. Now we're in another phase of it where, if you like, the, the chapters closed on last year, but we have this national crisis, really, about vaccinations. And I would like to see, and I, many people, and Australian people would like to see, and the premiers, I'm sure, uh, the facts and the figures that say we can do this by the end of April, May, June, July. And at that end of July, let's say, all of the Australian people will be inoculated, therefore will be in the strongest position to open up, uh, uh, you know, vaccinate first, borders second. Uh, the other way around is just an invitation to things going really wrong again. So we've got, to, we've got to deal with this phase, but we do have to have a very searching, open and honest look at 
what was done well in Australia and things were done well. I, it's, I, I do accept this, that it, if you're federal ministers and you're dealing with this stuff and nobody's ever put this in front of you before and you've got people coming at you from all quarters, it can be very tough. And I don't, I don't doubt the good faith of the ministers federally or the people who are doing this. I know many of them. But in the end, it's the results that matter. So let's accept everybody's acting in good faith, but we have got to do a better structural job for the next one. Because one thing that we know, Steve, the next one is on the way. And you it can come tomorrow. It can turn up from anywhere. It can turn up within Australia. One of the other lines that stood out in your book, Unmask the Politics of Pandemics, you said it's politics creates pandemics, not the virus. Uh, and that really stood out to me. So then, so you argue that given that, you say finally in your book, it's time to reconstruct the health system around prevention. Yeah. So what would you do, Bill Bartell? Well, over 98% of Australia's health budgets, unsurprisingly, are spent on care and treatment. You break a leg, you go to hospital, the leg is treated or you have a heart attack or something. Of course, that's what people want. But I learned at the time of the HIV uh, problem that the best thing to do, simpler, fairer, cheaper, was to prevent it. And if people could be persuaded to change behaviours with HIV, we didn't end up having the treatment costs, not to mention the human costs of infection and early death. We didn't have really any way of stopping people dying for a long time. So prevention is cheaper to the budget. It's so much better for the person who doesn't acquire the disease. And with the money you save, you've got a better chance at treating the people who have got uh, the problem, who have got the disease. So I would like to see a large chunk of the health budget reallocated to prevention. Prevention services delivered in communities all over Australia are who are in touch with their communities where people can be uh, persuaded, uh, recommended uh, to, to undertake, uh, to change behaviours. And of course, we live with that for 40 years. I mean, what is tobacco, 40 years ago, you and I would probably be sitting here in this Zoom meeting uh, puffing a cigarette. You know, <laughs> yes. That's all gone. You know, yeah. And it was seat belts. All the people who carried on about masks. But they drove to the anti-mask demonstrations in cars where they put their seat belt on. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it, it's just all of these things are simple and effective things. But beyond that, we do have to strengthen our public health systems. Uh, these are not things that can be done on the cheap. Uh, they have to be built up. Uh, Queensland has a very good system. New South Wales does. And under pressure, all of the other states have really upped their game. And those public health systems are really great when the crisis comes, but they spend a, a lot of time between <laughs> crises, if you like, strengthening the capacity and the resilience of the community to... Uh, see off the threat of infection. So prevention is the key. We have a system in Australia where we pay doctors and nurses after the event and to treat people, but we don't have the same premium on preventing disease. Yes. Yes. And if we want that, we've got to spend the money to bring that about. And we'll all be a lot better off if we do, in my view. Well, if our listeners who are online would like to send in their questions, we can probably get them to you shortly, but. Uh, we'll leave that to uh, Emma Kate and to, uh, to send them through. But OK, I'm the Prime Minister of the Republic of Australia. I've just realised that we've got this resource, Bill Botell, who's not spending enough time working. So I call you into my office and say, Mr Botell, I have to walk into the House, into the House of Representatives and make a public statement to uh, tell the people of Australia how I'm going to realign our uh, COVID-19 pandemic response today. I need you to give me three things that I need to tell the Australian people, open, honest and upfront, but what I can do now, Mr. Botell. Well, the first thing a person uh, would do in that position is saying, I am advised that we should do 
these things on the basis of this advice and facts and figures provided by my medical and scientific advisors and uh, other people. And I table all of those because while I believe that we might do this, I'm very open to uh, a broad discussion with experts and the Australian people to contest and debate every assumption that is made. And I do it openly and honestly in the hope that we can collectively come to a better decision, uh, particularly if that involves a lot of uh, uncomfortable or difficult changes or adjustments to be made. So first is complete transparency and openness. It's a scientific question. It's not a question of national security or uh, you know anything else. So be open uh, and do that. Secondly is to be humble. Uh, we run a sort of politics in Australia where we expect prime ministers and premiers to turn up on the six o'clock news and sort of hector and say something as, as gospel truth uh, and take it or leave it. And, uh, and we, we've heard a lot about empathy in the last uh, few months, but this is not how politics is conducted in many other countries. And I, I particularly instance New Zealand. Uh, the prime ministers are not um, held to be gods. Uh, they're not, their words can change and people have got to be humble and, ac and accept that other people might have uh, points of view that not only are different, but uh, uh, stronger and better founded in, in, uh, in the facts and figures. And the third thing uh, I think is uh, uh, if I'm advising a prime minister, um, as I've done, is to say, look, when push comes to shove, we're not governing for this or that sectional interest. Everybody who runs a travel agency or you know, has a business in Queensland, so of course they've got a personal interest in that business doing well, and that communicates itself. But that's a self-interest, you know, that's a, a, an interest, an economic interest. But in the end, when you come down to it, the, con the problems we face now in the world we face just with the virus, with climate change, because we do not accept science. We believe that we can have a political response to a scientific fact. And uh, I would say that the governments now who rely on science and facts and figures and evidence to inform policy in the general interest and oblige the, the sectional interests the people who, who will lose if we apply those policies, that's how we have to run. We have to run on the basis of science determining the outcome because all the future things we thought would happen with climate change, and you know, in the last year, I left in January in Sydney a year ago because I truthfully could not stand the fires, the smoke. The place was burning down and I, it, it really affected me. Personally, I went to London. Before that, we'd had the drought. Then we had the pandemic. And then we had these terrible floods. Well, all the things that we said were going to happen in the future are actually here and, here and now. So uh, we've kicked the cans down the road long enough. And unsurprisingly, at the end of the road, there's a Mount Everest of cans. And here we are. Now, things really do have to change. Uh, we cannot have the old politics that got us into these various messes, reassert itself uh, in, in, in the post-pandemic world. And I do think for all the faults of the United States, but I do think that President Biden is on the right track. I think, and I think the American people have come to that realization that there's gotta be a better way that will secure the health and wealth and happiness of the peoples of the world than the way in which we behaved in the last 10 and 20 and 30 years. I think that's come to an end. So let's hope that, you know, we can build back better. As I want, President Biden says. I want to sneak in one so, more question. I want to sneak in one more question. It's more about political policy. In your booklet, you say the Australian government should have understood that the model of aged care privatization and labor hire was highly conducive to the spread of virus in a pandemic, why? Well, 
one of the terrible uh, developments of uh, this um, neoliberal approach, the gig economy, the suppression of wages in Australia. Uh, I, wages haven't shifted in seven, eight years. In fact, in real terms, they've pretty much gone down. Mm. So what has grown up is a, is a, is a bunch of gig economy workers uh, who have replaced in places like aged care and to a degree in medical care and elsewhere, the skilled staff who are running those arrangements and those facilities in earlier years. Now, if you, if you replace uh, a highly skilled, well-paid uh, aged care nurse looking after one facility with labour that you say uh, is a gig economy job, they have to go from one place to clean the next place to clean the next place and the next place which we have, and because the private operators are therefore reducing the, the biggest cost they have, which is labour under these arrangements, and the light touch regulation is certainly very light touch uh, by the federal government, what happens? And, and this was told, it has to be said, to the federal government at the beginning of the pandemic, that people go from place to place to place to place. They didn't have enough PPE didn't have enough training. And what happened? Well, we saw, you know, the thing was, was spread around. And this was on the watch and the responsibility of, of the aged care ministers and the federal government. Now, it's, this should have been stopped. And it was understood in many other states, it has to be said. It, it wasn't across Australia. So some states uh, got onto it quickly. But other states in the bigger Melbourne, elsewhere, uh, they waited till the problem emerged. And by then it's too late, as we saw in the very regrettable situation that emerged in, um, in Victoria. So my, my thing is, well, let's learn from that. Let's not, are we going back to, are we going to change that system? Are we going to go back to what we ought to for the dignity of the residents of aged care and have properly trained, well-qualified staff in that one facility, looking after them, knowing them, taking care of them and doing that? Or are we going to just uh, chalk it up and uh, say, oh, nothing to see here and, uh, and keep on going with what is everybody knows who has relatives and parents and so on aged care is a very deficient but very expensive system. And it's expensive because you have a, a private, a set of private operators who do very well, thank you very much. Yeah. But that money is not being spent really in the interests of the people in aged care or most importantly with the people in the gig economy. And it was the same problem with the uh, hotel quarantine workers. It okay. was very unfair to blame those hotel quarantine workers for the problems that emerged because the overwhelming majority of them are doing the best job they possibly could in my view but they were not clinically trained. Yes. They were, they were forced. We had many people who were forced in Australia to keep working and not to say they were ill or at risk of being ill because how did they put bread on the table and pay the rent each fortnight? And they were the people who were not looked after by and large in the JobKeeper arrangements. So we created a very big problem for ourselves. For what? I mean, really, you know, throw another billion, two billion at it, look after them. Uh, we would have been that much better off. Yeah. Bill, thank you very much. I think you know, we might have time for questions now if we have some questions that have come in. Emma Kate. Yes, we have. We've had lots of questions come in. Um, we, I will get through as many as we can answer in the last uh, five or so minutes that we have of this event. So, um, Bill and Steve, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation and that's a um, really engaged audience. So Claudette has asked, um, she said, we're seeing reporting and debates in the media about the AstraZeneca vaccine and blood clot concerns. Based on your experience and perspective shared on trust, etc., what do you attribute this to? What is driving this situation and how can people navigate it sensibly? Undoubtedly for the well-being of the people of Australia, I'm not a doctor or an epidemiologist or a virologist. And I've learned over many years to defer 
on these technical questions to the, the most eminent virologists and so on in Australia and, and, uh, and to listen and act on their advice. Uh, the AstraZeneca <clears throat> vaccine, uh, I think, is very good. Uh, personally, I wouldn't have a problem with having AstraZeneca, but we do have to be aware of these reports. And certainly when you inoculate people in the millions, and we haven't had the benefit for any of these vaccines of five years of human trials, which we would have, uh, we're all in the middle of a big scientific experiments, things are going to crop up. So I hope, uh, I'm sure that the TGA and the responsible officials in Australia, uh, I, I have trust and faith in them. I'm sure they can look very closely at these reports uh, out of uh, Europe particularly and look at where countries have restricted access and, and really come to a, a good decision and I should be sure that they would have to follow it. Whatever happens with AstraZeneca, my own belief is that we should greatly increase the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, and these other vaccines. And we should do everything we can to up, up that supply. And then over time, we will have more of those vaccines being given to the Australian people and less proportionately of AstraZeneca, which might be a good thing if there are uh, continuing reports about problems. But Certainly, we've got to listen to, uh, in this case, to the people who know what they're talking about, the scientists. Thank you. Um, Valerie has said, thank you for this discussion. Um, Bill, do you have any suggestions about what Australia should be doing to help PNG? Uh, yeah, well, indeed. Uh, and one of the things I saw with the Prime Minister yesterday, which I fully commend, when he was talking about the 3.1 million doses that he was seeking to secure from the EU, he said the first million of those should go to Papua New Guinea, which I completely agree with. Um, as Helen Clark, the Prime Minister of New Zealand said, we're, none of us are out of this until we're all out of it. And we have a terrible situation in Papua New Guinea. Uh, I would like to see effectively whatever Australia does to procure vaccines for our 25 million people, we should add the eight or nine million people are in Papua New Guinea onto that list uh, so that we're thinking in terms of 30 million people to be uh, inoculated and to be uh, protected. So, uh, yeah, we, uh, and, and the government has put a lot of money, uh, COVAX, uh, the arrangements that are being done, uh, uh, people like Jane Halton and others. So all of that is highly commendable. And really, in the end, it's just a function of money. Uh, the more money we throw at it, the better. Uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't have the slightest hesitation about spending every cent, every dollar that we have to to secure vaccines for Papua New Guinea. Thank you. Um, so the last question that we have time for tonight comes from Phil, and Phil has asked, um, "How are we preparing for the long-term health outcomes of COVID infection?" Yes. Well, uh, one of the very good reasons to not live with COVID and to live without it that wasn't apparent a year ago were these long COVID questions. And there are 20 something thousand Australians who have had COVID or have COVID and it's unknown what the long-term implications of COVID infection will be on those people. Hopefully it won't be terrible. I have friends who've had COVID and they seem to have recovered well, but uh, there are other reports of uh, long-term continuing effects. And also we see in the United States with the most recent news that these new variants are affecting younger and younger people, which is a worry. Mm. But the best way to live with COVID is to live without it. Uh, I would hope that whatever happens now, uh, there won't be an Australian variant that's worse because we don't have any COVID cases in Australia. It will come from where we have replication out of control. We get these variants. So uh, I think one of the things in Australia we do have to do is establish a longitudinal study of everybody who's been exposed to COVID, who's got it, and uh, the scientists and the institutes at the Kirby Institute, the Doherty and so on, we've got to fund them to look, after, look at everybody who's had it and see what happens over one, two, five, and 10 years. 
and we can contribute a lot to international science if we do that. Great, thank you. We're getting lots of thumbs up and um, thank yous coming through the chat box now. Um, so unfortunately we have run out of time, so we will need to wrap up. Um, Steve and Bill, thank you so much for this fantastic discussion. Thank you. Uh, and thank, thank you. you all for joining tonight. I have posted the link that you can use to purchase your copies of Unmasked. Um, Steve or Bill, did you have any last comments that you'd like to make before we wrap up? Uh, Emma, Kate and Steve, look, I'd really like to thank avid reader and uh, Steve very much. Uh, you've got a busy day all day. So I'm very uh, honoured and grateful that you've taken the time to uh, put this event on. And I'm very deeply thankful to all the people who've uh, come along tonight. And especially I can see to my old comrade in arms there, Phil Carswell, who uh, like me was around 40 years ago at the uh, in the HIV days. So thank you so much. Pleasure. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody.